Okay, good morning, everyone. What a weekend. Carrie and I uh, went down to LA, helped our daughter move from one place to another, right in the middle of downtown LA. I took my big dually truck, that was fun. <clears throat> and uh, we got home about 1.30 last night, so we'll see how clear my thinking is. <laughs> I feel actually pretty good this morning. I wait till the east shots kick in. <clears throat> but uh, it was fun. It was actually a good time down there. And there was a lot of work. I mean, from Friday night all the way till we left. It was, uh, what would I say? It was a lot of work. <clears throat> but it was fun. I like doing physical labor and It was fun to be with Ariel. She's an awesome kid. <clears throat> okay. So let's just jump into this. I played like three or four times, apart from Tony Robbins, little 30 minutes for the next 30 years of your life. He said, let me pull it up here. If you identify yourself in a new way and you own that every day, and that becomes the standard of how you live, you'll find a way to make that standard real. And the powerful piece that he doesn't talk about here, but he understands identity, like making that identity real and doing it every day and then raising your standards. I really like that piece. Both of those together are what Wallace is talking about, thinking in a certain way. Um, standards meaning, he calls them rituals, standards, uh, things that you do that are a part of your already set identity. The way you dress, where you go to work, um, how you go to work, relationships, your constant habitual thoughts of your place in that workplace, like your individual place, that's your identity. Um, and most people don't know that they can change that and make it whatever they want. Um, one of the things I just felt important to say this morning, you know, I'm doing these, these template, I'm doing a lot of template interviews with people on my team. And what I'm realizing is like, when Oprah Winfrey says, dream the highest, grandest version of yourself that you can, people are, I wanna say this the right way so it comes across, maybe there can be some learning from it that, saves you a lot of time and effort. They're, they're missing the mark. They're missing the mark on dreaming that highest, grandest version of themselves because there's some insights that they're not seeing and holding space for, for themselves. And on one of the interviews I said, I'm starting to see a pattern here. You know, there, there is a pattern that I'm starting to see here of, of um, especially like a fourth level leader, having that identity of what a fourth level leader is. And according to John Maxwell, a fourth level leader in Isogenics is like, you have an elite, you built an elite organization that has leaders um, who are, that has not, you're not the only fourth level leader there. That's the identity of a fourth level leader. You're not the only leader there. You have other fourth level leaders, maybe even leaders who do it better than you do with their life skills that they have learned and developed in previous occupations before showing up. And, and these people rock. I mean, they are like building an organization themselves with or without you. And in most cases without you because they don't need you. There was a link where there was a part of the process where they did need you and you attracted them and you became a essential piece for them to now be living 
the identity that they have for themselves. And what they were missing was the vehicle isogenics that could take the roof off, literally. And they've already built the skills around that, that isogenics is the vehicle they've been looking for their whole life. And because um, it literally takes the roof off with everything, with everything, self-actualization, your identity, uh, taking the roof off of that, taking the roof off with your health, taking the roof off with uh, your income, take, taking the roof off with the impact that you can make, even taking the roof off of the leaders that you could develop and create a huge ripple effect. And so <clears throat> most people fall short of that highest grandest version of really owning an organization that's like a Swiss watch. It's just, it just operates on its own with or without you and mostly without you. That's what Robert Kiyosaki says on the cash flow quadrant. So, you know, an elite organization would totally be big business. You can leave unannounced for six weeks and, and uh, your business does just fine or better without you. You're not texting, you're not following up, you're not making sure that people are doing things and that they're having their events and that they're doing their meetings and that they're going out and sharing isogenics. It's already doing that without you. So uh, I always ask people, okay, so now that you're a fourth level leader, what would you be doing? And what their mind, what their identity wants to identify with, well, I would be doing more meetings. I would be doing more follow-up. I would be spending a lot more time. Like I really need to increase the hours that I need to be working as a fourth level leader. I'm like, wait, as a fourth level leader, that's what you would have to be doing. You know, you'd have to be doing a lot more of the level one, two, and three actions. And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't. You don't have to be doing any of that. You're on the beach. You're at, on a safari in Africa. And you hit your biggest week, you hit your biggest week in isogenics while you were gone for two weeks. You know, and then you come home and you go to Disneyland for a week. And then after that, you, you know, a month later, you go to Europe for 10 days. You're there, you've arrived. That's the identity. And people just can't quite get there. They think they have to be micromanaging and working their way to that fourth level leader. And then when they get there, they'll know it. And then they'll get to have that freedom. It's not how it works. You have to have the identity first down here. I am a high fourth level leader. I built an elite organization with platinum income earners in my downline, making over $40,000 a month on both teams. I'm on my re-entry, I've maxed out. I cycle over 250 times every single week. While you're down here at level one, whoops, <clears throat> while you're down here, you don't work your way to the identity and then get it. You get the identity first. That's why I put Mechanic to Millionaire on the front of Isogenics, the first magazine they came out with. But Mechanic to Millionaire, Dave McCarthy. A nice little picture of there with me in my suit coat. And uh, page, I don't know what it was, page 46 or something like that. That's what I said. And I just Photoshopped it back then. And, uh, you know, I, I held to that identity every day. It was a new identity, a new way of looking at myself. Now, the reason I did that wasn't because I had the courage or I learned how to let go of my past and forgive myself. And, hey, look, and I'm not, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm just going to be real. I didn't write everything down on a piece of paper and then burn it, you know, and then everything was all of a sudden taken care of. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't go through therapy sessions. Um, and I'm not going to say that you can't do those things. What I did was I studied the heck out of the principles. Not only did I devour this book, I devoured, and I devoured this book over and over and over. It's not about the number of books. It's about reading the right books and getting what you need to get out of the books. And I read Charles Hannell. I read Raymond Hollywell. Uh, 
you know, just so many books that I read. Oh, not so many, a few books that I read over and over and over and over in a way that, quite frankly, I don't believe 98% of people would. They wouldn't spend the time. They wouldn't spend the redundancy. They wouldn't spend, you know, the time and effort and focus and concentration on a few books like I did. And I'm not saying that egotistically or, you know, to, to hold myself on a pedestal. I'm doing it to draw a contrast and, and to help you become aware of something. I literally did that in a way that I just don't believe most people would. When I say most people, literally 98%. I have no question I could have got my doctorate's degree if I was in college, but it only would have been a singularity of thought, like how to control my thoughts and feelings and why. What are the principles behind that? I wouldn't have been off learning other, you know, general studies. It was just that one thing I wanted to know. <clears throat> and um, that is what taught me that I can dream this highest, grandest version way before I've ever gotten there. And I could frame it up right with all of the different dynamics that are in place. So just like the, uh, the template, I, I put this template together basically 14 years ago but I didn't know it looked like this on a piece of paper. And there, every single part of this is absolutely critical. This is the roadmap right here, along with holding myself to that and to that. So what does my calendar look like? What's my schedule look like in the physical world? And Lynn Hagedorn said, Show me your calendar and I'll tell you your future. She just said that at New Year's kickoff, which is so true. Show me your calendar and I'll show you your future. So we have, you know, what days of the week am I going to work and what hours and what am I specifically going to be doing? Times and income producing activities, which is connecting. When I opened my shop, if I wasn't getting people to come to my shop and purchase my services, there's no way when I open my mechanic shop, that I would be able to feed my family. It was do or die in that moment, right? So talk about income producing activities. They were not cleaning the shop. They were not, you know, uh, reading books on how to be a business person. They were, you know, not calling my friend and asking them what they thought about it. It was literally printing up flyers and handing them out and selling myself, the features and benefits. If I wasn't fixing a car, that's what I did. I picked up more flyers and I drove around. And nobody was free, not even, nobody was safe. <laughs> not even pulling up to a stoplight. I would stop the car, I pulled, especially next to a Honda because I was a Honda certified mechanic and my whole thing was about Hondas. On my, my, my menu flyer, it was a menu showing the prices and the jobs that I had, timing belt, brakes tire rotations, oil change. And uh, so I would roll down the window, honk the horn at a stoplight, pass a flyer through the window, and then yell to them what the features and benefits were. Right? And I did it with energy and certainty to where the people gave me a thumbs up. And people that responded the same way with when I shared isogenics. When I treated isogenics like that, people still responded to me to the same way. They didn't say, is this network marketing? Or is uh, this a pyramid screen, uh, uh, pyramid was scheme? I just never got those questions. I mean, every once in a while I'd get them. They were not something I got regularly. My energy was too strong. My certainty was too strong. I knew my, my identity was too strong. My love for other people was too strong. My desire for them to take their life to the next level was too strong. And that doesn't just happen, you guys. It's something you foster. It's something you become clear on. It's a, it's, 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 it's a well-strategized identity. 
Now, there were some things that happened for me putting the products in my body that like took my life to the next level. But I didn't forget about that and it didn't fade away and it didn't become secondary. That was the thing that became, you know, part of the main focus. So, you know, the bottom line is this right here. You better be framing up an identity of yourself that has new prospects being connected with, prospects becoming customers, customers becoming associates and consultants, and your cycle's going up from month to month. And it better become a conviction, a new identity for you. If you're letting the prospects and the customers and, the, and, and other people dictate to you what your identity is, you're done. Your goose is cooked. There is no way the physical environment is ever going to be confirming to you on a day-to-day -day basis with all the mundane things going on and all the interactions, your identity. There is no way the environment's going to do that for you. Not even like, not even in my position where I am now. If I started giving in to the, the identity of the environment and what people suggest, I would slowly start to backslide. That's why I came up with in the podcast when I was doing Charles Hannell, guard your focus with your life. There's a watchman at the gate. I can't remember who said that. It might be Hollywell in, in uh, working with the law the watchman at the gate, like there's this little guy on guard. He's a sentinel at the front gate and he never sleeps. He is like an angel that just never sleeps and he's got his sword right there, always in his hands. And uh, watching, ever alert, to make sure nothing gets past the brain. And what I mean by that, nothing ever comes in. You can't stop something from happening. You can't unsee what you saw. You can't unhear what you heard. But I can absolutely guard and protect what I start to make agreements with. And it's those agreements. At first, you know, when you're creating that new identity, you're, you're vigilant against it. The watchman at the gate is ever vigilant. And uh, I just didn't let the, the guard down. I just didn't let it down because it will wear away at you in this world of entropy and uh, it's like gravity. So, but what happens is, is you don't have to live your life like that forever. It's the first 30, 60, 90 days. Like it says right here, 30, 60, 90 days, because then you start to rewire the brain and those neurons start to fire together. That starts to become your new identity. But anybody's identity, especially if it's at a higher than what most people's is, is always going to be chipped away at if you're not ever vigilant. That's why I've never stopped thinking about these, these things and, and reminding myself and listening and, and always looking for the, that confirming outside voice to listen to. A, a book, an audio book, a YouTube. All right, so when you're... When you're at this, this is your new identity up here. Let's say this is your new identity, that you're one of the highest, grandest version of yourself. And let me just get back to saying, it wasn't the, it wasn't just coming up with listening to something vaguely and then saying, oh, okay, I'm gonna frame up my vision for myself, you know, at this high fourth level leader, you know, because that's my highest, grandest version. What I'm finding and what's helping me to articulate this is that as I've been doing this, nobody has gotten it right. I don't care how much money they're making. I don't care what kind of success they've had in life. Nobody has even come relatively close to framing up the identity of a fourth level leader accurately. And so what I'm realizing is that people are incapable of doing that. And I'm not saying that from a judgmental point. I'm saying it from recognizing it and seeing a pattern here. Not one person has even come relatively close to framing up themselves as a fourth level identity leader. That is, got the beach mon money coming in at maxed out over 250 cycles a week. What that identity looks and feels like and then being able to write it out, to speak it, 
I mean, let, I mean, as I'm going through this, I'm bullet pointing stuff and nobody's able to speak it for me to write it out. They can't give me the words that would be the identifier and the reconfirming evidences that they're a fourth level leader, that they nailed it. Not one person has been able to do it. And I've done over 50 of them now. And, and so there's this aha moment for me that's helping me to realize, okay, I, I didn't think the first, you know, 30 of them, why was I able to do that? I didn't even realize I was able to do that. I'm just at, you know, that point where I'm experienced that life now, but I did it back before I was even cycling 20 times a week. It was the principles that taught me because I had understood them so intrinsically. And when I say principles, you, you, you can't even really comprehend that. I'm just going to tell you, I started to understand principles that are unseen, like the law of gravity, right? Um, we know the effects of the law of gravity, but most people don't really know the principles in deep detail. In fact, a lot of science, well, science, I still don't think, I think I'm still debating, like, why does gravity work? Why do we stick to this, this ball that's rotating around, you know, over a thousand miles an hour through space? So uh, there's these other principles, again, like the law of non-resistance, L and R, the law of vibration, um, the law of compensation, um, the mental faculties. Uh, there, there, there's some other that I'm not super clear on, on bringing those out, but those types of principles right now, you know, the law of attraction, which is really a result. Um, understanding those so deeply and so profoundly, it was just like, of course, that's how I'm going to write it up. I'm a millionaire in isogenics because I understood the workings of those principles and how I am to apply and facilitate them in my life. Now, it didn't make it any easier, you know, the self-betrayal in taking on that identity. And, and that's why I came up with this here. You're journaling every night to make sure that your mental actions are not self-betraying. And, it, and we're gonna, I'm going to read right here from Science of Getting Rich how important that is right there. And, and somebody totally screws it up in the movie The Secret, I think it is, or maybe I think it's the movie The Secret. And, and she says, well, we're not really asking you to, you know, what are the thoughts going through your mind all day long? That would be impossible. I'm like, what are you talking about, lady? I knew what my thoughts were all day long. Like, that's the level of accountability I was holding myself to, knowing what my thoughts were all day long. It didn't mean I did it perfectly. And Lenny said, okay, Dave, so how often do you do it? Meaning, how often am, am I connecting with what, what Tony Robbins said, how that identity and, 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 review, and, and, be, and reviewing it every day? How often was I reviewing it? And with the results I got, he said, you probably do it for like an hour. No, probably like two hours every morning, right? And I said, Lenny, it'd be easier to ask me when I'm not doing it because I try to find the times when I'm not doing it. I try to identify the times when I'm not doing it and I get back to doing it. And it was like, I would go inside and, and be in that fantasy world. And, and I would be living it. I'd be experiencing it. I'd be connecting with it. I'd be feeling it. And I would want to do that on the level of getting to the emotions. That's why you really have to concentrate and focus. Like you got to see the imagery and you got to experience it and, and get the emotions behind it. That's why, you know, my, my kids would say, mom, he's doing it again. If you have ever watched uh, the something of Walter Smitty or whatever that movie is, I uh, can't remember the title of it, but something about Smitty or something like that. Um, he would daydream and you would go into this world of daydreaming with him. And then he'd come out of it and he'd be right in the office and people are making fun of him and calling his name and he didn't even hear him. In fact, one guy threw something at him and it kind of startled him because he was into his fantasy. That's how I was. And for most people, I don't care what you're doing, we can pretty much do most things on cruise control. We've done them for so long. There are so many times during the day when you can be doing that. Um, 
you know, so, I mean, how often have you driven and you don't even realize what you got, how you got there, you know, because you were checked out, but you got there in the ride safely. I'm not saying do it while you drive, but there are so many times when you can be doing it again, mom, you know, there's so many times when you can be doing it, living that fantasy and visiting it and getting emotionally connected with it. And what I understood about that was it didn't matter what it was, it didn't matter what my past was, it matters right now in the moment. And that really, you know, brought a lot to, you know, my understanding of time, you know, time and space. And what I had read and understood about that from Eckhart Tolhall or Tolhall Eckhart, whatever the guy's name is, the power of now. So, Eckhart Toll. And uh, <clears throat> so when you're coming up with this new identity for yourself, so here's the new identity. And I, you know, uh, the, these lines represent to me, they could be frequencies, they could be waves. As we get down further and further, the waves are less tight. The higher they get, the higher the frequency, right? And the waves become almost like a straight line, but there's still an oscillation in them. Light is a very high vibration. Like those waves are very short. And uh, light is synonymous with truth. So as we move up, we're more aligned with truth. There's more of those areas of our, uh, that were, that the dynamics of our lives are aligned with truth. And you can just see a person that's lit up. And, and then I could also see in people, I can see something missing in people that are on this journey. You can see it in their eyes. You can hear it in their voice. Like they want the truth so bad that they're just missing something. They're missing something. And there's this frustration. There's a sense of, I wouldn't really say discontent, but it's almost like a shielded discontent because they're missing something. And, and so there are areas of our lives where we can have truth, but the more we can get them framed up in a completeness and in a whole, that's when you see, you know, somebody that's just in the zone and they're not only does their countenance and their, their demeanor show up, but their life shows it, their circumstances. So that's up here where everything's clicking. And it doesn't mean you have to be rich, but definitely abundance is a law. So that would be a part of uh, your life, right? A dynamic of your life being rich is abundance. So there is a law of abundance, not a law of lack. L law of lack would be down here. If, you, if you're always in want and, and that's of things and time and resources, then, you know, that has to do with money. Um, and so your, your belief level down here, your waves would be more like this, where you have, you're, you're not living the law of abundance. You're not understanding it. And so, therefore, I guess you could say you're breaking the law, and therefore you're going to have negative results. You break the law of health, you're going to have negative results with your health. You break the law of abundance, you're going to um, be more in, you're going to be more in want. All right. So as we move up, so this is the new identity. You're, you're saying, I'm going to align with a higher frequency of things when you create that new identity. And that's a thought pattern. As spiritual beings, I think, therefore I am. That's your greatest capacity is to think. And your number one achievement is to think the thoughts and have the feelings you want to have. That's your number one highest achievement. Somebody who can think what they want, and feel what they want, regardless of outer circumstances, and not betray themselves, See, what happens is most people will have the identity, and the Bible says, looking in the mirror, you, you, you create that identity in the morning, and you're looking in the mirror, and there it is. You've got it. You're locked in on it. But then you leave the mirror, and straightway, you forget the image that was in it. <laughs> you start betraying like crazy, because you didn't keep the watchman at the gate ever vigilant. You didn't guard your focus with your life. You lost focus. You lost concentration. You let the day overtake you. Charles Handel says that's going to be the, the greatest work you undertake to do is have thoughts that are opposite than what your physical senses are telling you in your past experiences. So what happens is, is an event happens. What I've been using in the personal interviews with this is you're driving down the road. 
you're listening to your audio, you're listening to Tony Robbins and you're thinking about your image and you're connecting with it and you're on the highway. And then all of a sudden you're going up this long, long hill like I did coming out of Bakersfield, California, headed north. And um, uh, this diesel, it's a two, let's say it's a two lane highway. And this diesel pulls out from behind another diesel and gets in the fast lane. And you're now stuck behind this diesel in the fast lane that's taken 15 minutes to get past the other truck in the slow lane. And uh, if you're not ever vigilant, you will start to get upset. You will start to get irritated. If you're an unconscious creator, you'll get mad. You'll start going over into the shoulder to make sure that that guy sees you and that you know he screwed up and that you're ticked off. You might even flash your lights. You might even swerve in and out, back and forth out of that shoulder, you know? And you might start saying some things. And for sure, you know, you're feeling a certain way. You know, that's, that is a self-betrayal. You are totally not thinking about your identity. It pulled you off track. And when you want the new identity, when you're not thinking the new identity, your brain's either gonna to go to cruise control with whatever, whatever it used to think with your old habitual, consistent, hamster wheel-like identity that you've worked on for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. If you're not putting it in consciously, you are defaulting to whatever it was before you started thinking about the new identity. Because there's nothing in you that's taken on the new identity. So whenever you're not putting it in, I can guarantee you in your first 30, 60, 90 days, something else is going in that is not serving that new identity. Absolutely. Unequivocally, are you hearing me loud and clear? If you're not putting it in consciously, something is going in that is not serving you. That's why I was either doing it or listening to something that's telling me why I should be doing it. And so that's asking a lot of somebody, but only for the first 30, 60, 90, 120 days. When I started doing it from day one, 120 days, I quit my job. It was just over 120 days, four and a half months, and I replaced my income because I had held a singular thought framed up, not in a singular way. They had a lot of dynamics in it, law of compensation, um, you know, the money, specifically the amount of money that I'm going to make, but the law of compensation has to do with customers. Framing up leverage, getting all these pieces right, you guys, in, in all, all five areas and holding a singular thought. And in the beginning, you know, I just didn't do well in school, in high school. I didn't even know where my locker was. I never took a book home. Probably through half through ninth grade. After that, I never took a book home, never read. And so um, I just didn't have to think new thoughts, right? And uh, so once I started doing this, I felt like a Mack truck had run me over at night. I felt like I'd been run through the ringer because I was, my thoughts constantly wanted to go to here, but I would, with my willpower and determination, bring them back to here. And thought is a behavior, just like working out as a behavior physically. My thought is a behavior and every behavior has a cause and effect. And so I would, by willpower, sheer willpower and being hungry, I would bring my thoughts back to here. And it was physically demanding on me. And I felt like I was being run over by a Mack truck. So I'm just telling you this because if you don't feel that way or you don't hold yourself to that standard, good luck. Good luck. You'll forever be searching and, and trying and, and not able to come to, you know, the identity you want to. Tell you, you have to raise your standard. Like Michael Jordan said, I hold myself to the fundamentals and standards at a level that no other human being would. So, but at 30 days, it started getting easier and easier. But I absolutely was singular of thought, singular. I mean, nothing, no fun time, no concerts, no watching a movie. I mean, it was literally like towing the line. And I guess, you know, being around somebody like that, you know, I don't know what that would be like, you know, from the other perspective. 
because quite frankly, I've never been around somebody that's held themselves to that standard. Um, so, um, that you've got to do, but it, then your mind starts to develop that discipline and that mental muscle. All right. So there you go. I, I, the reason I'm bringing that up is just because again, this blueprint and then holding yourself on that level. So why I, can't you just clean your yard lady? Sorry, you guys can hear you guys. Somebody's unmuting themselves. <clears throat> Somebody is like self betraying right there. Did you hear that? <clears throat> Because the law of attraction is the law of love, you guys. And when I went into work, I was like the best model employee. Because I had to straddle the identity and being a mechanic and cycling less than 20 times a week and holding the identity of being a millionaire with two teams that are going downhill like a train. So how did I straddle that? Well, I just showed love in every circumstance. You know, I've never... That singular of thought, I didn't do it perfectly, but I was like the airplane that keeps bringing itself back on course. And, and so what I wanted to show here was, you know, even at work, I would go in and I would outgrow my position. We'll read that in, in, in the Science of Getting Rich here. We'll get there and with Wallace. Wallace says, you got to outgrow your current position. Don't worry about what you're doing right now. You'll outgrow it. Uh, and you got to show up there and, and give excellence into everything you do. So I was waxing the lips. I was cleaning the tool room, which no mechanic ever cleaned the tool room. Nobody's ever waxed the lips. But I was doing things that came to mind that nobody would ever do. So it was the first. And I was holding myself on that level. I was more uh, 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 ready to help customers, you know, that were out on the service drive. Like the service drive, uh, the guys will come and say, hey, can you come talk to this customer? You don't get paid while you go out and talk to a customer on the service drive. You only get paid while you're fixing cars. It's called flat rate. And so I would be more than helpful with customers. Um, and, and so I, I did that, you know, in, in every situation. And then while I was doing, you know, my work in isogenics, I did it with that same attitude. I wasn't doing, like I had to be doing these things. So I was straddling being a, a fourth level leader but I had to do the task and the micromanaging of a level one, level two, level three. If I didn't do it, my business would have disappeared and gone backwards. But I did it with a whole different identity and a different attitude. I didn't have to do it. I didn't need that person. I just did it because I love doing it. And I did it like I was mechanicing now. You know, I was doing it with the highest, grandest version as I could. And I was doing that with sharing the message, following up with people, helping them return their products. I mean, nothing got me down. Nothing got me down. And I, quite frankly, I did that more effectively than I do now because I wanted it a lot more then, All right? So, you know, I was proactive with all of it. You have to be proactive because there's nothing in you intrinsically that's gonna do it when you stop consciously thinking about it. So what happens is, is you start, I, I, I'm telling people, okay, so what I did is I wrote on a, a uh, legal pad and I wrote out my identity in, in sentences and paragraphs. So there was literally like page after page after page and I'd read them every morning. It took, a, it took a while to get through it and I'd just read each line. And if I needed to make a little adjustment, I would in the moment. And I would just read that like a book. And <clears throat> um, what I would recognize was you know, oh, wait, I'm, I'm self-betraying myself in that area. So I would totally flip it 180 degrees with where I was self-betraying with, let's say it was the truck driver. Let's say the truck driver was, you know, the thing that set me off. I'd put truck driver and I would consciously become aware of it. And then I, I, you could give the justifications. I'm asking people to do this because this is what I did without writing it down. I was doing this and identifying while I was reading my identity. And then I would just become aware of how I was not being true. Uh, I wasn't being, um, above all else, to thine own self be true. I wasn't being true to that new identity. It would come to mind, oh, I screwed up here yesterday. Or I screwed up here a couple hours ago. Um, so you got to identify that every night journal where yourself be trained with that identity. And so 
the reason you do that. And I would start writing in the new identity. I am the most congenial, I'm the most loving, most patient, kind driver on the road. Like, I totally understand. And I allow people to get in front of me. I love people. Whatever I would do, to, whatever I could come up with to write down very specifically. And I would write it in as part of my new identity. Because I was identifying what was holding me back. Like that person that just we heard unmuted on the phone. Not picking on anybody, but they were upset about something, right? So I wanted to be true to the identity. And, I, and, and if you're upset and not loving in any other area, you've got to, like, that's, that's negating what you're working to accomplish because it's the opposite of love on some degree. And so I'd have to come up with, uh, you know, something that was more loving, a new loving identity in that particular area. So now what happens as you write that down and you journal it, you're becoming consciously aware of it. And I'd write down the justifications, what set you off and then what, well, because I had the right of way. That person saw me in the fast lane. This is the fast lane. This is for fast cars. You know, and does that person know who I am and that I need to get somewhere? And he's just driving a truck anyways, you know? And, and my pride and my ego, right? Write those things down so you really become aware of them and then reverse it. 180 degree polar opposite and write it into your new identity because that's the thing that's self-sabotaging you. When we say self-sabotage, we don't sabotage our goals on purpose. So you're now going to identify and evaluate through journaling these things that you're self betraying. So let's say you did that for a half hour and then, you know, you pull off and you go to the store and somebody cuts right in front of you. You had the right of way to for a parking spot. Somebody cuts right in front of you. That didn't happen by coincidence. It's because the way you were feeling right here, you attracted that person cutting you off and taking your parking spot. So now you're mad for another half hour, right? And then you go into the store and you're pushing the shopping cart and all of a sudden the wheel just starts getting jammed up and it's making this noise and you're pushing a shopping cart that is annoying the heck out of you. That didn't happen by coincidence. All right, so what we wanna do is stop the madness. Now, by doing this over and over, what we're doing is we're identifying that so that we identify the event. And when you write in the polar opposite and you'll start to recognize the event sooner and sooner, your watchman at the gate will become more consciously aware. So instead of two hours, instead of two hours self betraying and that whole time you're doing that, you are not being this. And that's killing you. That's keeping your dream away from you. That's keeping your right customers away from you. That's keeping your right business partners away from you while you were doing that for two hours. So what happens is you start catching it sooner and sooner. So you only go down here for 30 minutes and you're like, oh, wait a second. I realize what I'm doing. So then you loop back and you get going down the right efficient action, which is moving you towards your goal and moving your goal towards you. Now I understood the laws and the principles that absolutely unequivocally told me that that's what was happening. Not only am I trying to get towards my goals, but my goals are trying to get towards me. So you got the people trying to work towards you and I'm trying to work towards them, but I keep taking a right turn instead of a left turn. I had to eliminate those, weed the garden. We've heard all of these things, right? Weed the garden, you know, forget the past because as you're going down the emotions of the past, what are you not doing? You're not doing an efficient action. You're not going down this way. And by law, pure physics, you're not gonna reach the goal and neither is your goal gonna reach you. This is the level you have to do it on. And so what happens is, as you continue to work on this and you get better and better and better, and you're not comparing yourself to anybody at your personal best, you'll get to an event and you'll pay no attention to it and just stay right on course. Like it doesn't even bother you. I listen to all the petty things that people talk about when they're building their isogenics business and all the problems and it's the company and it's the customers and it's the associates. That is a self betrayal. It's those things are getting you to hamster wheel the things that are self sabotaging you and they're just keeping you away from your goals. And some people love the emotions of self betraying more than they want their goals. But most people don't know what they're doing. And if they did, they wouldn't be doing it and they wouldn't allow it. But it's still a mental muscle, even if they do know it. So this right here, 
is somebody who can have, do, and be anything they want because they've now mastered, they've done the number one achievement. They can think the thoughts and have the feelings they want to have. And if they frame that up in a certain way, they are guaranteed to get it scientifically in the laboratory every single time. It can't be stopped. And if it's not that exact thing, you know, it will be something that's equivalent without violating the rights of anybody. You're not taking anything away from anybody. This is creation. And over here, this frustration is what causes competition. <clears throat> so let me just read from Wallace Waddles here. Um, so we finished, well, uh, I ended on the, on the paragraph. I have said that men get rich by doing things in a certain way. This is a certain way. This whole thing is a certain way right here. So not only do we have to frame up the blueprint of the identity correctly with all of the different dynamics, dynamics. If this dynamic wasn't in there when it comes to building your isogenics business, if this dynamic wasn't in here, good luck, you're gonna go sideways somewhere because you're negating that and you've gotta have that in there. It's gotta be in there in the right way. All of this does. So even myself, this is about me and what I'm gonna take ownership of. And if you got something from your past or something that's holding you back, you don't understand the principle and you're just not creating the new identity. And then if you do, you're not doing, this piece is so critical. All of it's critical. All of it is critical here. So that's the certain and scientific way. And if you do it, he says, right? Um, what do you say? And by experiment, I find the reasoning true. This is my strongest proof. If one man who reads this book gets rich by doing what it tells him to do, that is evidence in support of my claim. So I read the book, but I didn't just read the book, you guys. I internalized it and it became an intrinsic part of me. And it wasn't just that book. It was other books that were like it, but they taught me some other principles. And like I was saying, most people are incapable of writing this up correctly. So I'd go through and listen to that Zoom that I did several Saturdays ago. It's the complete overview of the template. I really go into this specifically right here. And there's just not enough views on that Zoom. I know it's an hour and 50 minutes, you guys, but man, try, you know, reading two months nonstop, different books and internalizing two months, right? And, and then even after that, for the first two years, I was reading like that. So uh, I'm sorry, you know, an hour and 50 minutes. <clears throat> I know that's asking a lot about two episodes of Friends. Um, I have said that men get rich by doing things in a certain way. And in order to do so, men must become able to think in a certain way. A man's way of doing things is the direct result of the way he thinks about things. To do things in a way you want to do them, you will have to acquire the ability to think the way you want to think. Even though people want to think the way they want to think, they couldn't frame this up right. They were incapable of doing it. I would say 98% of people are incapable of framing this up right. And what I love, you know, about being able to play the role that I get to play, like the stage, like Bob Buckner said, it's a, the world's a stage. And most people write themselves off as like, uh, they write themselves into the script as a, what do they call them? You know, those people that get paid like 50 bucks or whatever for being a, you know, just a part of the movie in the background. They write themselves into the script like that. Not me. I understood the principle. I'm like front and center spotlight on me. Not in a pride egotistical way, but in a way that would help me to self-actualize, which would make a difference for me and my family. So um, acquire the ability to think the way you want to think. This is the first step toward getting rich. To think what you want to think is to think truth regardless of appearances, regardless of appearances. And truth is capitalized here. To think what you want to think is think truth. I was thinking now uh, along the lines of principles. So those higher frequency waves. Every man has the natural and inherent power to think what he wants to think, but it requires far more effort to do so than it does to think the thoughts which are suggested by appearances. I learned through understanding the principles 
that appearances have nothing to do with it. And then when I heard, you know, other ways of saying that years down the road, that it's more like a moldable quantum plastic soup, you know, you know, and that everything is a result and the physical world is in constant flux and change. Always, nothing stays the same. A hundred years from now, this city won't even look the same. Like everything's in constant flux and change. To think according to appearances is easy. It doesn't take any effort at all to think according to appearances or to the past. To think according to appearances is easy. To think truth, regardless of appearances, is laborious and requires the expenditure of more power than any other work man is called upon to perform. To hold that identity right here is going to take more work, more focus, more consistent concentration on a conscious level than anything you've ever done. Some people love extreme sports where your life is in peril every second because it puts them into that zone where everything else is disappeared. Everything else is faded out of their life, all their cares, worries, problems, and they have to focus on this thing or they die. And that's why some people are addicted to extreme sports in the face of death. So, you know, when you can really frame up the right dream and have the right vehicle to support that dream, that's why Isogenics showed up, you know, because when I wrote that dream book back before learning these principles, those dreams were too big for any other company to be able to answer. And I had framed up so many different areas of my life. They were just too big for any other company to be able to answer them. There is no labor from which most people shrink as they do from that of sustained and consecutive thought. There you go. It's not just my words. You know, I thought it was just my words, but I read it. It became an intrinsic part of me. There is no labor from which most people shrink as they do from that of sustained and consecutive thought. It is the hardest work in the world. This is especially true when truth is contrary to appearances. He keeps saying truth. Like my fantasy is the truth and the outer world isn't. Like everything that's happening, of course it's not true. I've been down here. I was not living my life according to truth. Abundance, health, contribution, compensation, the law of compensation, that would be impact and being rewarded for that impact that I'm making. And also the identity of myself on the level that I am making the impact. I wrote down, I'm the greatest trainer in isogenics. I wrote it down because, in, and that's up here, right? To be the greatest trainer would be thinking things of truth if it's in a non-egotistical way. If you're thinking about being the greatest trainer for outward appearances and to have people, you know, admire you and to be getting those accolades, that's on the sandy foundation. You wouldn't have other pieces of truth in there. And, and that wouldn't be truth either, so you wouldn't be up here. But if it's according to principles, why I want to be front and center and under the spotlight, if it's according to principle, it will be truth that I'm now intrinsically incorporating and making a part of me. And, and then wrap that all up in a nice present where everything is in place. And it will be, and this can only be prevented by holding the thought of the truth. So I was now holding truth, the highest, grandest version of myself. It was framed up based on principles. It wasn't some guy at a seminar telling me in two hours how, you know, affirmations are important and that you need to think of the highest, grandest version of yourself and then go sideways with all of that. That's why I'm telling, that's why when I decided I was going to do this, I, there's, I don't think there's anything out there that is going to frame up the way this is being framed up because we're going to use the company, we're going to use the, these principles, and we're going to present them in a way, quite frankly, I don't think it's ever been done before. Not on this level, and it's for as long as we're going to do it. And uh, I don't see a finish line to this. But I gave you a lot of practical application here today, a lot of what's going to be expected of you, right? Not holding any punches so that 
I hope that you like me and that you feel good when, you know, when I share what I have to share. This is for those right now, the two percenters. Eventually, this will be like the ABCs. Eventually, everybody is going to be thinking this way because heaven is going to come to earth. I absolutely believe the prophets of old. Right? I believe in those prophecies from the Bible that heaven will be on earth. And this stuff that you know, we're learning here will be like the ABCs to people. They just know the ABCs. So, and, and Bob Proctor said, I don't, we don't know when you start the goal, how long it takes to get into a physical mirror counterpart, like the physical world collapses around it and now it's a part of your life. But he says with farming, we know with a carrot, it takes 120 days, 90 to 120 days for the physical, for the seed to become the physical mirror reflection of a carrot and then you can eat it. Well, I was pretty close to a singular of thought. Like I held myself on a level that most people wouldn't, but it wasn't perfect. But he said, there will be a day when we know, okay, I want this goal. I want this to happen in my physical world. Here's how long it takes. I would say 120 days is a pretty good guesstimate. You know, and that's what I've always told people. 30 days, you have things happening, but it's not, it's not your identity yet. You're in the transformation stage. If you hold a singular thought for 30 days, I'm watching things happen in the first week with people. Confirming evidence that are matching up perfectly with their new identity because they're playing on that level for the first couple of weeks. It, a, a magnet attracts right away. If, if this was the magnet and this piece of metal immediately, it, it pulls it to it. And so the, you know, God's universe works the same way. At 30 days, there's some compelling evidence, but there's also a lot of things in your life still that are the opposite because you've been attracting those things for years and decades. They're not all gone. And quite frankly, they never completely leave. We live in a world of entropy. So, but at 60 days, a lot of things are starting to happen. People are wondering what the heck you're doing. At 90 days, you know, now people are like, wow, you're not even the same person. You've grown a lot. And your cycles are starting to reflect that now. At 120 days, I was isogenic full time. I wasn't the millionaire, but I was isogenic full time, $2,500 a month, $2,500 a month in 120 days. But I was pretty close as you can, as there's, there's probably somebody who can do it better than me for sure. But I would say right now, very few that are committed on that level. Um, but I was pretty close to a singular of thought. So the carrot 120 days, becoming full time isogenic 120 days. So I think that's a good guesstimate on the physical world changing when you play at that level that he's talking about right here. And this can only be prevented by holding the thought of the truth. Just about done here. To look upon the appearance of disease, disease will produce the form of disease in your own mind and ultimately in your body. Unless you hold the thought of the truth, which is that there is no disease, it is only, it is only an appearance and the reality is health. All right. So there is no truth. There is no law of disease. There is a law of health. Call it the law of health, right? So with that, a lot of practical application on what's expected of you. You know, are you up for the challenge? So I'm going to unmute here, see if anybody has anything they want to share. Okay. Just Let me put it, uh, hold on one sec. I'll make it so you can unmute yourself. Okay, it was. All right, there we go. Anybody want to share anything? Hey, Dan. Hey. Good job. I uh, was watching the Super Bowl, and uh, the uh, star of that, uh, uh, of Kansas City, was uh, Patrick Mahone. And um, uh, I hadn't seen him play or anything, but uh, the close ups of his face, he had that look. And it made me think of uh, when your kids used to say to Carrie, he's doing it again, mama. <laughs> you know, this Patrick had that look on his face. And you could see that sometime during that game, he was going to walk by San Francisco, the most dangerous defense in the NFL. He had that look. And uh, that was amazing, you know, 
he he had it framed in his mind and uh of course all they could talk about was uh the amazing things he would do and but you could see on his face that he had it the mindset was there you know they'd show other players but his mindset was there you could see it in his eyes yeah you can see it in athletes athletes are really good tennis golf now you never know what's really going on in their mind well, let me rephrase that. We could guess at what's going on in their mind, but if you want to know what's going on in their mind, look at their results. <laughs> look at their results. If you want to know what's been going on in your mind, look at your results. Some people don't want to take 100% responsibility for the results that are in their life, but they can't be any other way. Yeah, it might be somebody else's fault, but that's only because you're listening to them and you're agreeing with what they have to say. So you might be right, it's not your fault, but you're not doing anything about it. Or maybe you are, maybe you are doing something about it. But if you're not doing anything about it, you'll jump from thing to thing, to thing, to thing, to thing, to thing. Well, to thing. and in the last two minutes, the, the thing that stuck with me was, uh, Kansas City had the game, okay? And so, and so the players naturally are thinking about the Super Bowl party, right? And, uh, and, and the audience is thinking, well, just run the clock out and collect your darn trophy, okay? You know, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. And he's yelling at the team, don't stop playing. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, he was reminding them, this is the most dangerous defense in the NFL. Don't stop playing, you know? I may have to go back and watch the rerun because I didn't see it. I was moving our dog. Well, and uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, I think is very important. Um, the coach, when he took over Kansas City, he was uh, one of the winningest coaches in the NFL, but he'd never been to the Super Bowl. And the first thing they said was, everything changed the day he showed up, okay? And I want to emphasize, you know, a lot of people look at the template and are taking it for granted, okay? I mean, uh, when you and I did the template, amazing, stunning things happened immediately that could not be explained rationally, okay? Um, there, there's a lady that uh, um, had texted me back uh, I have your number as uh, a telemarketer number. Don't call me again. And, and now she's a consultant. Yeah. Just like that. No okay. And there are no coincidences that somebody that went from hell no, Malcolm, to, oh, let me, let me sign up my daughter because she needs the money. You know, yeah. just uh, unbelievable coincidences. And it came out of that template and now there is a training class a youtube that walks you through the template step by step which makes it duplicatable okay yeah I, can, I just i just so, realized nobody's going to be able to figure this out without getting the detail like i've been doing on my own team's personal interviews there's no just question no way you would get it there's no way you right. would get it you yeah. know and the thing that i want to you know you're bringing up something for me um and who are the two teams in the Super Bowl? I take it San Francisco 49ers? And Kansas City. Kansas City won. Chiefs? They, they, they won. They were at the Super Bowl, Super Bowl number four. They were at the Super Bowl 50 years ago hmm. in 1971. Wow. Okay. I mean. They had to change the mindset. The mindset had to be changed. That's yeah, how, but, they got there. how do we know they changed their mindset? Because they're at the Super Bowl. Did they right. win? Did the Chiefs win? Yeah, and and There's and this guy Patrick yeah. Mahomes, he's he's throwing. He he can actually. You know how a quarterback will 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 fake to the right and then throw to the left. He'll look right but throw left. But they always look left. Eventually, he was throwing passes without looking. 
and hitting and hitting the receiver in the chest. Nice. I've never seen that before. That's, okay. that's a mindset, you guys. That was like being on the motocross. I was doing things on the motocross track that I knew wasn't me. It was that greater power, that intuitive right. thing that's breathing us. And it's way more powerful than our senses are and our own muscle movement, you know, based on conscious movement. If you'll allow these miracles to happen, you know, and the thing that I wanted to say was too, I wasn't stuck to the emotions of the past. What I'm recognizing is, is that there are people who love the emotions of the past more than they love their fantasy, their highest, grandest version of themselves. But see, because I learned the principles, I have an advantage. To me, the things of the past became more like a mathematical equation. I just don't get emotional about mathematical equations. And I kept telling people that. I kept trying to teach the principles and people just are never gonna internalize them no matter if I teach them till I'm blue in the face because they're not internalizing them. They're not going out and reading on that level that I did. And, uh, um, and so they're never going to look at their past like a mathematical equation. I have no attachments to the past. It's not who I am. It has nothing to do with my identity and who I really am. The principles taught me that. And so any mistakes of the past, and trust me, I made them. That's not me. You hear John Asra say, that's not who you are. Well, I knew that as well because I understood the principles. And if you try to tell somebody that and let that override just because I told them that, like, don't be attached. It's like a mathematical problem. They, they don't know what you're talking about. They're still attached to the past because they didn't get the principles. But what I'm seeing with the template is I don't have to teach the principles. I just teach the work that you need to do and then frame it up in an isogenic business. We teach the blueprint and people are stepping into that. And then if they'll do the journaling, they'll automatically start treating it like they knew the principles. If you identify where you're self-betraying, I don't care if it's an emotion from the past, you just got to rewrite it, flip it, make it 180 degree, polar opposite. Whatever it is that's stopping you from thinking about your new identity, anything that pulls you off. And remember, it doesn't have to be something negative that pulled you off. A distraction is a distraction. A Super Bowl football game is a distraction. If you really, really, really want your goal bad enough. Like, I used to watch football all the time, and I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, but I'm going to tell you that any dist all distractions are equal. So if you're working on a new identity, but for two hours you watch the Super Bowl, plus the midtime, halftime show, whatever it is they show, and you, you stop putting in the new identity for those two hours, there was nothing in you that was attracting to you what, you, you, what your goal consists of. That's a distraction. I stopped watching sports, and I haven't, picked, I haven't picked football back up. That was probably one of the sports that I did watch, you know, you know not consistently, but I watched. You know, I, I didn't even know it was the Super Bowl yesterday until yesterday morning. That's just a habit. I'm not so concentrated like that anymore. I, I kind of am right now because what's on my blueprint, I really, really want it. So I am getting back to that place where it's almost a singular of thought. But I have never done it as much as I did the first two years in isogenics. I'll be transparent with you on that. I've never done it on that level. But I'm getting closer to that than I've ever been right now because of how bad I really want it. But all distractions are equal. It doesn't matter if it's a negative thought or just a distraction. All right, so be careful if you really, 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 really want it really, 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 really fast. That's all I'm saying. No judgment, I don't care if you watch the football game, it's awesome. I'll probably watch the highlights of it or something. Um, you know, I wanted to mention, Dave, that uh, that uh, stage four behavior. If if you would like to exhibit stage four behavior, go through Dave's hour and fifty minutes with one of your new excited people, and help them to unpack what they really want. Guide somebody through that process, watching that video. Okay. That's stage four. You're helping somebody envision a much bigger 
version of themselves, okay, in a concrete way, that's that's stage four behavior. Yeah, and make sure that you're starting from the box number one because gradiently we get there. And the right. way we build the dream, the mind just really doesn't resist it because, of course, this is where I am because this is what happened. So um, I know, thanks, Malcolm, for that. I think there's some a lot of value in you know that masterminding process that you always bring. Um, I just want to give anybody else a chance to say anything, and then we're gonna conclude for now. But don't stop. Hey, Dave. Don't conclude in your mind. Yeah, Teresa. <laughs> I want to thank you for all this because um, I've been with Isogenics for four years and the last couple of years have been the self-sabotage, self-betrayal. And you really made that very clear for me this last few sessions on here. And it's kind of like the game last night, you know, they were under pressure and um, they kind of fumbled a little bit and thought they were going to go back but then they came out on top. And I kind of feel like that's where I'm at. I'm finally able, because of your Freedom Planner and these Zooms that I'm able to come out of that shell and finally get that success and help others like I want and not worry about what they think and because I'm not who I used to be for one thing. So those people aren't in my life anymore and it's okay. It's just becoming okay with that. And I've never been good with rejection. I'm even getting okay with that. It's like, I know I've heard it a million times. Don't focus on the outcome, but just right. put it out there. If you don't put it out there, you'll never know. So I'm finally there and I want to thank you. <laughs> that's exciting. That's, I, I love, thank you for that feedback. That, that's the goal of this, right? Because it's those little nuances, those little things that we're not seeing. And uh, when we go into it in detail like this, those that want to see and are ready to see are going to see it. And, and it starts to make sense. It's almost like you already knew that. You know, when it says the spirit will bring things to your remembrance, I guess, you know, we did know those in this veil of forgetfulness that really helps us to grow and stretch and learn. You know, it is, it's like a bubble. I remember somebody explained it this way, like you're in a bubble, like the bubbles that you blow with the wand. And it's just right on the other side. It's transparent. You can see it. And when that bubbles popped, it's like it was always there. And so some of these things that we're learning, like the self-betrayal with your mind and the self-sabotage that we do unconsciously, when we see it like that, it's like, yeah, I totally knew that. But wait, I didn't know that because I've been doing that, you know? And then even with people that say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You're going to find things that you haven't identified yet if you'll do the work. And then you polar opposite it and you write up the new identity. And then like Tony Robbins says, you, let me uh, pull it up here. Because I like the way he says it. He says, if you identify yourself in a new way and you own that every day and that becomes a standard of how you live, you'll find a way to make that standard real. So I, I, I would switch just a little bit of that. You won't only find the way, there will be divine connections that brings things to you, those little miracles and they become, well, they're not little, they're big, but sometimes they're really big, right? So yeah, thanks for that, you know, thanks for that. Um, these little things that are just, it's like little adjustments, you know, little, little tweaks here and there. And I knew that that's what we would get. Some of them would be big tweaks and some of them would be just little things that we just quite didn't identify that you can switch like that. Melissa. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. That was just saying, paralleling my thoughts, just that um, even going to church, you know, I get, you know, seeing customers or whatever, you know, you get to choose what you think. And that's been a huge thing to go prepared to think the best things and not have a conflict in my mind and therefore be better received. Um, 
So that's been great. I uh, really appreciate this template as well. I think I've had a big shift this week and um, having greater belief in um, me and what I represent and um, just getting to some times to share. That's really great. Not, not worried about what other people think. And, um, and also has a lot of relationships have changed. So that's been good. Uh, somebody told me I walk like they noticed how I walk differently, like more confident or whatever. So that was like, really? What? No, no. You look at, you're just walking like you know what you're doing, you know? And I, so that was like a physical change, I guess. So that was cool. So just seeing that that's changing in isogenics and then um, just some of my physical goals, some great challenges and affirmations of people and things have come in this past week too, as I um, affirm who I am in that regard as well. And, and um, so I would love to meet with you, Dave. I'm not quite ready to meet with you, but I'm getting it all down and want to do that. But I recommend if you haven't done the two hours, what else are you going to do for two hours? Do it again. I'm doing it again for two hours. This training has just got to be in the core. It's who we are and need yeah. to be to everybody around us. So thank you. You're so awesome, Melissa. I just, it's been awesome watching you grow and expand and step thank into you. that. It's all your fault and God's fault. <laughs> right, yeah. God's gift we're, to me. Thank you. We're all doing this together with God's help. All right, you guys. Thanks so much. Uh, have a great day. And, uh, you know, let's finish this. Not finish this. Let's start this week strong. Get the identity. Amen. Yes. Drink an e-shot. All right. Thanks, yeah. you guys. All right. <laughs>